When we left the hospital, we were snuck out the back door at 2 a.m. because we were on the run from the moment I was born. By the time I was three, there was a, a point where she had really been struggling with addiction, with her own trauma. And so she dropped me off in the middle of the night at a foster home and just left. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Mark Groves podcast. We have a returning guest here, Shalina Ayana. Welcome. Thanks for having me. You know, whenever I say your name, I always laugh that I said your name wrong for like a year, but because you loved me enough, you let me. I don't think I even noticed that you were saying it wrong until one day you blatantly <laughs> said it wrong. You call me like Shalena or something. And I was like, that's exactly what I call, call me Shalena. <laughs> and you were like, yeah, isn't that your name? I was like, dude. And it wasn't even like, one year. Wow. No, it was more like actually like five years. It was probably five <laughs> years. Yeah, it's probably more accurate. This is why I'm not in charge of factual storytelling. And this is why we don't remember our past. As This is why witness accounts aren't actually accurate. Because yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like just telling this story as if my memory and my use of your name were less lengthy than they actually were. With all that said, I'm happy we finally got that corrected. Me too. So that I could refer to you with the proper name. And I love your work. I love you. I'm so excited to have you back on the podcast to talk about your new book, Becoming the One, which is a title that is near and dear to my heart, of course. I'd love to know what is the origin story of the title and, and like why, why that? And for the people looking, this is what the book looks like. Ta-da! Ta-da! This is what it looks like in the UK. I think it's really pretty in the UK too. Or in, in New Zealand Beautiful. and Australia as well. Yeah, it's so pretty. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me back. I always enjoy our conversations. Um, we have a good flow. And the book really, it's an all-encompassing journey of my story and healing your relationship patterns and what that really looks like. And obviously, as you know, as somebody who works in relationships, we often idealize the one and we think that there is this magical person who's going to come sweep us off of our feet and save us from our pain and from our wounds and that somehow our shit is just going to magically transform if we find the right person. And then all that junk that we're experiencing in our previous relationships is the relationship's fault. Becoming the one is really this idea that there is no one else. You are the one. And when you enter into relationship whole, then the chances of having that potent, magical, conscious relationship that you dream about are much higher because you've actually come home to yourself. So it's really that piece of self-awareness healing those painful patterns that we've been carrying with us through looking at, you know, our mother and our father wound, our relationship to our inner child, and then really getting clear on what we value in the world and what it is that we stand for and what it is that we want to create in our lives. It sounds to me like that's going to burst a lot of bubbles of the idea that <laughs> if I just change relationships, then I won't have to deal with that stuff. And don't get me wrong, sometimes changing relationships is actually a great thing to do and can move us on from old patterns. But the narrative that we'll find someone and all of a sudden all the struggles we've had will go away, it seems like almost a cultural narrative about the partner we seek or the person we're seeking to find. And Disney certainly hasn't helped us in any way with these types of things. The journey of facing all our stuff and seeing relationship as a place that invites us to do that. I mean, that's flipping the relational narrative on its head, at least, you know, I think so. Totally. And I mean, most of us did grow up on that fairy tale diet. I certainly did. I'm not sure what the younger generations are consuming now in, in regards to relationship, but TikTok, I'm sure it, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's like a light in a shadow, I guess, to TikTok. I'm not that I'm not really on TikTok, but I see some things through friends and I can imagine that's a whole other black hole there. But I even remember last winter we went to Mexico and I decided to check out um, Grey's Anatomy. I had never watched it before. And I was struck by the dysfunction and toxicity of the two main characters relationship was like Meredith Grey and I can't remember what his actual name was they called him like McDreamy was his you know he's oh yeah older. Patrick Dempsey yeah 
Well, anyway, so it was interesting for me because Ben kept saying, oh, yeah, like when I was in university, all of the, my girlfriends, like my friends were watching Grey's Anatomy and they were all obsessed with their relationship. And I talked to a lot of other women and they all said that they had been watching that too. And I was watching it and noticing like how my body felt when I was observing their like hot and cold relationship and how the behavior was actually so dysfunctional and unclear and immature and like not hot at all. But yet this is where we were resonating at when we were watching this, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, whatever it is. And I'm like, no wonder so many of us have these really strange programs going on. Because if you look at all of the media that we have consumed and all of the storylines that we follow, there are these really unhealthy patterns where there's like these super high highs, these super low lows. There's always games. There's not clear communication. There's chasing there's just childish behavior. And then there's also these big grand gestures where people just do these insane things that are actually kind of disturbing and then also crossing a lot of boundaries, but yet we glamorize that as a way of showing love. And so if we're just going based on just that one part of our conditioning, then you look at our familial conditioning and what did we learn about love through our first family that adds on another layer, right? And it's all so complex. And so we actually often need to rewrite our entire understanding of what relationship is, right? And that actually takes time. Like you said, of course, we can sometimes end a relationship and that will you know, immediately make things better because it's true. There are some times where there's just not the right person. That said, you can be with the person that you are ultimately meant to be with, a soulmate type person. And you're still going to have the same patterns come up. They're just going to look differently because you might have more tools or you have a little more awareness, but the patterns don't go away on their own and they almost never go away. They just shift with you as you grow. And so that's kind of what I wrote this book for. It was like this whole journey of let's just unpack here and then let's really come home to who we are. Let's learn how to feel safe in our bodies so that we can stop chasing love or glamorizing what looks like love but isn't. And then we can find true partnership within ourselves and you know, with others. Yeah, to normalize this idea that that finding the right relationship won't make your triggers go away. You know, it'll it'll actually bring them forward. And in a lot of ways, if you have two people who are mutually willing to grow and mutually willing to look at what's being reflected then you're really on to something. And sometimes I think the movement of pattern is if someone isn't willing to grow with us is that as a change of pattern is to let that go, you know, to find something that is. Relationships are so complex and yet they're not in their simplicity sometimes, you know, and I know that even in saying that, that's probably confusing. But what I mean by it is this journey within ourselves, this opportunity to fully step into our wholeness what does that mean? How would we even know that I'm maybe beginning to get to that place or I'm on the right path? Well, I think most of us do come from some sort of conditioning that tells us that we aren't whole. You know, a lot of us come from religious programming where we're born sinners. You know, that's a really interesting one. So you're born bad, essentially, and you need to be saved, right? And like, if you look at like the creation story of European people, it's sort of inherently built in that we're already not enough. And then we translate that over into our love relationships as well. We just sort of copy that template into every other domain. And then if you look in the like new age spiritual realms, then they have the twin flame where half of you (laughs) and half of them has somehow split off into the universe and then you have to find each other. But when you do, it's going to be extremely chaotic and volatile, but you have to stay together, you know, no matter what, because you need to complete each other and like complete the cycle. Otherwise you're going to both come back and do it again. Right. And it's just always this narrative that somehow you're not enough or somehow you need this external person. And it can really lead us to a, staying way too long in relationships that don't serve us, clinging and chasing unavailable love or pursuing avoidant partners because we've decided that they're their soulmate or they're our twin flame. And we're really having this idea that life doesn't begin until we're in a romantic relationship. And so 
we'll go on a date and we won't even actually check in with ourselves whether we like the person because we're so focused on whether or not they like us. So it's this outside approval seeking and we're out of our center. And so we can really notice that in ourselves. And I work with a lot of women who experience that on some level, sometimes quite extreme, where they're only attracted to people who are not available and avoidant. And it's sort of this self-fulfilling prophecy of not having to actually go deep with anyone and we don't actually get to experience intimacy. So it's a bit of a guardrail for our own fears of intimacy, right? And so when we start to see that, we have to start to get bored of the pattern. We have to actually get tired of it. And then that's when we're really on the precipice of making a big move. And usually that happens in crisis. It doesn't often happen when we're just, you know, having the best time of our lives. It's usually those rock bottom moments. (laughs) right? Like something bad happens, we lose something, we lose someone, a relationship ends, somebody dies, you know, everything falls apart. And then we're on our knees and we're like, oh my gosh, this pain hurts so much. What can I do to get rid of it? And then we're like, okay, I'm, I'm willing to do anything. And then that's when our, our minds open a little bit and our hearts are sort of already completely shattered. And so then we get to say, okay, well, how might I be playing a role in this? And so it's actually a really beautiful opening. And I experienced that for myself when I was at rock bottom. And then I had this epiphany that actually it was my childhood trauma all resurfacing. And as painful as it was, I was really excited because I knew that I was in charge. And then I actually didn't need this person that I was mourning or you know pursuing to change or do anything because it was really up to me. And I had to just work with my own patterns and my own inner child and heal some of those wounds and that I could be okay. So when we realize that we're not busting this really amazing fantasy that there's the one out there, like the one isn't a healthy thing to cling to. So when we can realize that and, and know that you know when we learn to hold ourselves through, that we will actually get better and have more power and more clarity, more confidence than we can create the life we actually want. And that's when we know we're ready. We have to be willing to kind of bust ourselves on some of those attachments to old beliefs and stories that we've told ourselves or that we've been fed forever. It's kind of too bad that human nature tends to be that we're not just sipping coffee being like, Oh yeah, I should change that relational pattern. You know, it's it's always this emergency shattering necessity to reconstruct. You know, I think it's Tony Robbins who says you change because you either it hurts so much you have to or you learn so much you have to. That learning creates the dissonance, the pain of awareness. Our culture is so much designed around numbing the pain of the awareness. You know, like you think we're marketed to based on fulfilling ourselves or being enough so that we don't feel, you know, the pain of misalignment and the pain of painful patterns, you know, alcohol, drugs, all that, even prescription medication allows us to not feel these things. You know, I think for a lot of people, when we're seeking to walk our way home or into wholeness or into stepping into becoming the one, we need teachers who have walked that path. And I think it's important for people to understand that you're not just espousing this from the top of some academic ivory tower. (laughs) You're speaking this from your experience. And I, I think it's really important that people know what you have come from, what you have transformed and changed. Because when we see someone else do it, even if their experiences are more traumatic or however we might label or create hierarchy of pain, we then see, oh, if they can, then I can too. Would you be able to share with us just where that started and a little glimpse into your journey and and what patterns were coming up and, and maybe, you know, how they changed or what happened when you changed them? Yeah, I think it is so important, like you said, to have other people that have walked the path before us all of us need. That's why we we long for elders. We long for mentors and we long for mothers and fathers who can guide us and nurture us, right? And so many of us didn't receive that. Like you said, I don't share this wisdom that I have from reading a book or, you know, going through a textbook. Of course, I've done, you know, numerous therapeutic trainings at this point in my career, but it's not really coming from that. It's coming from this deep 
ancestral wisdom and my own history and my own journey of essentially having to die and be reborn in order to be able to trust love or experience human connection in a way that I was completely not set up for with my conditioning. The moment I was born, I was in my mother's womb while she was in the psych ward where she spent a lot of time throughout my childhood. I feel so grateful that my mom chose to even have me and that she got me this far because she came from such, such painful history. These are the kinds of traumas and abuses that like, I can't even really speak of because it would just be way too traumatic to even repeat. And, but, but I know those stories and I held those in my body when I was very young. As you all know, I've had guests on the podcast exploring how to optimize the body, how to optimize the mind. I think about it in the context of my relationship to my performance and complimenting my body or empowering my body through really good sleep and looking at things like adaptogens and nootropics and that kind of stuff. Recently, I've become aware of a company called Cured Nutrition, who I absolutely love. And there's a podcast episode with the founder named Joseph Sheehy, and he's an incredible guy. So I can't wait for you to hear the story of its birth. And one of my favorite products from them is a raw CBN nighttime oil. This oil has a three to one ratio of CBD to CBN, and it's just specially formulated to improve sleep quality and really promote that deep relaxation relaxation and a longer, more restful sleep. Now, each bottle contains 450 milligrams of full spectrum CBD, 150 milligrams of CBN, and natural terpenes that synergistically support relaxation, stress reduction, just improve sleep. And I gotta tell you, I absolutely love them. You just put one dropper full under your tongue 30 minutes before bed, and I've been feeling really deeply rested when I wake up. I'm getting some serious REM. My dreams are off the chain and I love it. And this company Cured, take a moment and really check out the episode that I did with the founder. This company Cured is perfectly in alignment with my values, the integrity I live by. I love the founder. I want you to check out that episode so you can learn a little more about them. And right now Cured is extending an exclusive offer to you, my listeners. You can grab the CBN night oil or anything else that they have for 20% off. Just go to www.curednutrition, so C U R E D nutrition.com slash create the love and use the coupon code create the love at checkout. So once again, that's C U R E D nutrition.com slash create the love. And again, use create the love, the coupon code at checkout to save 20%. Based on the time of year and what's going on in the world, I am all about making sure that my immune system is operating at its best. I want to make sure that it is in tip top shape so that whatever it might meet, it is able to fight off. One of the ways I do that is I use Organifi immunity. It's 100% organic. It's got 500% of your recommended daily dose of vitamin C. And that vitamin C is sourced from organic cherries. It contains the immune boosting power of ginger, turmeric, and also zinc. It is gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, vegan, all of those things. And as I said, 100% organic and it also has a vegan source of D3 from lichen moss, and that provides 1,000 international units of vitamin C, which is 188% of our daily recommended dose. Vitamin D is so important to modulate innate and adaptive immunity. So if you're interested in giving your immune system a boost and a little bit of extra oomph uh, in order to fight off what might come towards you this season, check out Organifi.com slash create the love. You get 25% off anything you order from there. They have such incredible products. I love them as a brand. I love them as a culture. I love them as a company. Go check them out now. So when she gave birth to me, you know, we were in an emergency situation. And basically, when we left the hospital, we were snuck out the back door at 2 a.m. because my father was, you know, pursuing us and was not a safe person. She wasn't even really in relationship with him. It was interesting for me to learn that piece too, that we were on the run from the moment I was born and we didn't have a home. Wow. And so for the first probably year of my life, we were just bouncing around from place to place. 
which, you know, will lead up to context that I'll share shortly, which is, you know, so deeply embedded into my own patterns that I had to work through. And so, you know, by the time I was three, there was a a point where she had really been struggling with addiction, with um, alcoholism and her own trauma. And so she dropped me off in the middle of the night at a foster home and just left. And I, I didn't even know I was going to a foster home. There was no conversation. There was no preparation of like, mommy's going to go and try to get better. So I'm going to take you to this place for a little while. It was just pack you up. We're going on a drive, put me in the arms of strangers and disappear. And so that was sort of my first trauma. And then in that foster home when I was very young, I, I experienced sexual abuse. And then from that point on, I was in and out of foster homes until I was 12, which at that point I became what you call ward of the government. And so when you're ward of the government, they become your legal guardians. So you basically have these invisible figures who are your parent who sign off on everything you do and they can prevent you from doing things. Like I couldn't get a driver's license when I turned 16 because my invisible parent said no because they're liability because as foster kids, you're just liability. And so when I turned 16, I moved out onto my own and I started working two jobs and putting myself through school, like through like an adult education program. In the midst of all of that, I also experienced a lot of my own addiction. You know, I I used a lot of drugs and alcohol and to numb my own pain. I didn't have healthy relationships. I was so guarded. I was like the angriest kid because I was so sensitive and I was so, I'm so small, right? Like, you know me, I'm four nine, right? I'm like this tiny little human. And so growing up like with street kids, literally who were, most of them were five years older than me. Most of them had been to, you know, jail or juvie multiple times and like committing crimes and it's just not a safe environment. So the idea of being vulnerable is just not an option. Like you have to protect yourself at all times. And so even if you're hurt, which many times I was, I could never show it. And so I sort of learned how to armor this deep sensitivity. And then behind the scenes, I was always writing poetry and writing and having these really deep experiences inside of myself, but nobody else would ever get to see. By the time I turned 19, of course, I you know entered up an abusive relationship because that was all I knew. And it was this really intense he's the one, like I literally said, he's the one to my mom on the phone. And we just went into this chemical puddle of obsession with each other. And, you know, within a few months we moved in together and then it got really violent and I'm very lucky to have survived that relationship. And so that sort of was the first catalyst for me where I had this moment where I had been hurt really badly and I looked in the mirror and I didn't even recognize my face. And then I had this insight. It was like this voice was just like, you're here to work with women. Like you're going to be speaking about this one day. And it's funny because it was like, you're going to be speaking on stage about this one day. And then I remember years ago, it was like maybe four years ago, I was speaking on stage at one of your events about this. And so it came full circle for me, you know, it was like 10, 15 years later. Mm, It's beautiful. Yeah, it was just a really intense, intense time for me. And then, you know, as you know, because we've known each other for almost 10 years now, I got married in my early 20s. And then that relationship blew up in my face and it ended in deep betrayal. That was the catalyst. That was like it, where I lost everything, my money, my business, my health, my partner ran away with someone else and just left me with a house full of his things for almost a year, piles of debt. My cat ran away. It was like anything I tried to hang on to was just gone. And I remember when he was driving off and I started to feel three and then I realized like, oh, this is not about him at all. This is really about me. This is this is some deep old stuff that I've never felt. And I got to say, when you have never let yourself feel your pain and it hits you all at once, it's pretty debilitating. I thought I would die in my sleep some nights. I was like, I'm not going to survive this. But I did, you know, and and I'm here and I'm in a thriving marriage and I'm the happiest I could ever imagine myself being. But it did take that insane rock bottom, stripping everything away and crawling out from beneath the roots of a tree and really like finding out who am I underneath all of that armor? What's beneath those masks? Oh, I'm actually very sensitive. I'm actually very tender. I'm actually very afraid. And it was this honesty that was required 
And that's what's required from all of us to have what we want. And it's terrifying to do that when we've been conditioned to self-protect. So that's why this work is so important to me because I know how hard it is to trust love. And I'm experiencing such beautiful love now in all of my relationships. And I think relationships are the most important thing on the planet. It's literally what fuels us and it's what makes us either safe people or unsafe people in the world. So it feels like just such a, a heart-centered mission for me to help other people who maybe have that story in some way, who come from unsafe childhoods or you know, pasts that weren't so safe and helping them find themselves so that they know that they are worthy and whole and deserving of all the love. And it doesn't have to feel like a roller coaster. You know, so many of us, I think, think we're broken from our life circumstances or from our childhoods or whatever it might be. And also compound that with the message that you're completed by someone else, like Jerry Maguire, you know, the famous line. And you add all of that to this idea that that anyone can actually learn how to relate differently. Anyone can learn how to be better in relationship. And, you know, I really, that that moment of him driving away and you experiencing this grief, this loss, this abandonment, all the things, I don't want to put words into your experience, but, you know, being able to sense something and sense that it's actually unfelt things from the past. And I feel like when Kai and I broke up, which is obviously different circumstances and different, you know, I don't want to say it's the same because it wasn't. I really felt that a lot of the grief I was feeling was old grief that I'd never processed. And there was a blessing in that. Like I knew I was confronting something else and I was confronting it sober, which that was the first time I was confronting grief sober. And at the same time, it was heavy. Like I remember thinking like, oh, when you do that equation of being, you know, being alive is better than not being alive the other side was winning, you know, some nights. And I was conscious of that. I was able to be conscious of it and be present to other people that, you know, offered hope or offered, you know, they were just present to me so that I could look to them and be reminded and be grounded. But I think you don't often know what's being born in those moments when everything feels like it's dying or abandoning or leaving. What were the steps like for you to just begin to do that. Cause I think that's where there's probably, you know, I'm sure some of you listening are like in that moment where everything has walked away or everything has been lost or a lot of things have been. And then it's like, Oh, like what's the North star? How do I begin? Yeah. I mean, totally. It's going to be different for each of us in, in some way, but that's why I created originally, I don't know, this book, was is a program as well. Becoming the one is a program, right? And I kind of built it in a way to take people through it in a gentler way than I did it for myself because the way that I did it was, I mean, I don't regret anything, but it was very intense and very full on. And it was a lot of deep seeking and there wasn't a lot of guardrails. Like I didn't have enough holding in that. I found a spiritual teacher. I began doing transpersonal therapy and deep shadow work. I did a lot of breath work. Like every single week I was doing this rebirthing technique, which I don't even do now because it's so intense, but I, that's where I was at. I just needed a lot of intensity because I was in such an intense process. And I worked a lot on my mother wound and my father wound, which my mother wound was a lot more conscious for me because I grew up with her and I had known her of course all my life and I had never even met my father. So I could sort of create these fantasies about who he was. So that was something that kind of had to come after. But working on my relationship to my mother was probably the biggest thing that I did to uncover my relationship patterns and see how so much of what I had been creating in my history was rooted in that dynamic. As I went through that process, I realized how much I had been contributing to my own relationships not working out. And how I was really actually not open and I wasn't able to be vulnerable or even honest with myself about my own pain. So how could I ever relate or connect to anyone else in theirs? How could I have an authentic, mature relationship? You know, so of course I was attracting people who were at that level or worse, you know, 
And that's not to say that, you know, I was ever to blame for any abuse that happened. People are responsible for how they behave. But I could see how what I was drawn to and resonating with on a nervous system level was very much familiar to me. I see what you're saying. Like the the behavior matched acceptable behaviors that you had encoded or learned through your childhood. Yeah. And on a nervous system level, it felt the same. And maybe it didn't look exactly the same, but I was used to the feeling of like adrenaline rushes from running away all the time or living on the street or, you know, whatever it is, you know, having fights with foster families and leaving and really chaotic, hot and cold relationship with my mom where I wasn't really allowed to express anything other than, you know, harmony. If I was expressed anger or sadness or anything, I was sort of kicked out. And so I got really used to this, this sense of chaos. And that was what love was to me. Right. And so of course, all of my relationships had this element of chaos, of sudden change, of instability, of untrustability. And I had to recognize that pattern in myself in order to change it. And so that's really what this whole program and this book was birthed from, was taking people through that journey in like one clean line, sort of, (laughs) instead of having to flail through it. (laughs) Um, and honestly, even in my marriage to Ben, it really, these patterns still lingered, like the, the chaos patterns and the wanting to run, it really lingered until we got engaged and we got married at four years into our relationship. And for the year that we were engaged, I can't say that we've ever fought so much. Like we had so much conflict and I noticed that it was as if my whole body was rejecting the idea of staying, even though this was such a safe, healthy relationship. And we literally, we have such an amazing friendship, but my body was like, no, we don't do this. We leave at this time. (laughs) And so it's time to like uproot our lives and just crumble everything to the ground. So I, I would walk with him sometimes in the forest and I would just say, you know, I noticed that my whole body is trying to go in the opposite direction. And I'm really just having to tell my body that we're safe and that we're doing this, but this is what's happening for me right now. And so I had to be really conscious of that. And so it didn't even, it didn't die the moment I met the person that I, I feel that I'm, I'm meant to be with it. It stayed. And I just had the awareness and the tools to slowly disengage that program until it it no longer had any power at all. And then my my body was able to reorient toward security and safety and just finding bliss in the most mundane moments and and not even having this concept of like being bored in relationship because being bored in a sense is actually a good thing. Like you just want to be happy if you're having these high highs and these low lows all the time. Like that's actually not a good thing, right? So mm-hmm. it is also about this this process of accepting that our patterns aren't going to just disappear the moment we find a partner that we can go all the way with. And we just need to have the the awareness so that we can work through it slowly and gently within ourselves. Two things that I think are really cool there. One is when the relationship itself is this sacred space and container, it is safe for you to bring those things forward. And as opposed to being attacked for them or abandoned for them or rejected or someone getting reactive about them, that there's actually a curiosity to understand the process or the pattern or the reactivity in order to heal. And that was such a difference in my own perspective in relationship was to see like, wait, this actually can be a space where we can both bring those things forward. And as opposed to rigorously trying to protect them, the same effort can go into understanding and healing it. And so I really appreciate you sharing that because that's such a beautiful, wow, it's so it's so amazing to see that occur. And then I forget what my second thing was, but I'm still high off that first one. <laughs> well, and I know, I know you and Kai went through a process in your own way. Like it's a totally different story, but I know that you guys also, you know, you had to unfold in order to come back together more healthy, more whole. And I, I think you guys are such a beautiful example of people who are aware enough to do that and who had enough safety and self-awareness and self-esteem 
to take time apart and to come back together to create what you have now. That's such a beautiful thing. And I love that you both honored yourselves in that. And I'm friends with both of you. And I just admire the path that you've both walked in this. It's it's really, it's a gift to, to witness. And I think it's a great role model for others. And I think a lot of people, they fantasize about getting their ex back, but the conditions just aren't right. And so having people <laughs> right. who have been through it in a really healthy way and can say, like, here's what it actually takes to do this well. Like, here's what you actually need to have in place for this to even be possible. Like, we need people like that holding that space. And that's what you and Kai are doing. So it's really great. It, we've both like walked alongside each other as we, all of us, were going through relational shifts and up leveling and up, you know, whatever the terms are. And, you know, there's something about, because without relationship, we wouldn't have that, you know, and I think there's something about romantic relationship because it's such a mirror of the template of what's created with our mothers, especially that this deep trust. And if like the trust in the world is fractured early, it is so courageous to re-examine and explore that template and be willing to create a new one. You know, that's, it is like, if we can take full responsibility for how we show up in relationship and what we bring to it, then all of a sudden we're free. Cause then we're like, oh shit, I can pick up the pen and change what this looks like. And for you to put it in a process of a book, cause I know, right. When you're trying to figure out how to do it, you're like going to this teacher, going to that one, reading this book, doing this training, doing that thing. And it's like, People are like, yo, can you just put that all in the book? And you're like, yeah, I did. I called it Becoming the One. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a really cool process to write this book. Really hard at first too, but I'm excited to see how people receive it. I know it came out already like a month ago in Australia and New Zealand and people were tagging me saying it's the best book that they've ever read. And it was just so exciting to see people vibing with it and really enjoying and I did my best to, you know, share personal stories, not as a way to make it all about me, but so that people could see what's possible. And also, I feel like when we are in circle with others or when we're sharing with others and other people lead with vulnerability and can be really honest about their own stuff, that it's sort of an invitation for us to be more honest with ourselves. And that was really my intention as I was infusing essence into this book is let's be really honest with ourselves so that we can really awaken, you know, and we can really have what we want. And it really does require that depth of vulnerability that is, yeah, not easy to get to. You know, there's a lot clouding our our belief systems and we have a lot of guarding of our hearts these days. By all means, there's a lot of reasons to self-protect, right? But ultimately, if we want to experience intimacy, we have to find a way to move past that, at least with the people that we're safe with. We have to be willing to step into that space of stop running from our problems, stop running from the things and actually stand still and acknowledge them to change them. What you're saying, I relate to a lot. Like I think one of the hardest parts I had, and I think it's been layered, like it's been you know, it's kind of like your triggers never go away. You just keep figuring out where they show up on deeper and more tricky ways. And I think in so much of my journey, it has been a fear of actually telling the truth to myself about who I am, what I'm afraid of, how I actually feel. Like you said, like when you actually accepted what was truly going on below, that you're sensitive, that you're afraid. I mean, that was so much of me accepting myself was accepting my high level of sensitivity and my fear of being hurt, you know, being abandoned, being betrayed because my earliest relationship had betrayal in it. And the second one too. So it was like, oh, when I love people, they're just going to find someone else to love. That's great. So I'll just come up with all these strategies like date unavailable people. You know, a really good strategy is to date people who just got out of a relationship. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> Didn't work out very well, though. <laughs> no, but I mean, we all have our mechanisms, right? And we can laugh about it now but when we realize when we're in it, it seems so real, you know? And then we don't realize that we get to blame other people for being unavailable when really it's a good way for us to hide, you know? It's like, it's oh, so well, brilliant. it's their it's fault. So they're brilliant. unavailable. Like if they would just show up, then like we would be perfect. But the truth is, is, 
you know, what happens if that person actually comes towards you, you know, on some level, they're just a placeholder for your own intimacy fears and your own unavailability. And people never love hearing that. And they might even completely protest it. But if we really sit quiet with ourselves and see all of the ways that we, you know, may block love from coming our way, it's pretty true for most of us. (laughs) So true. I mean, I would become like Usain Bolt if someone walked towards me. I'm like, peace, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I remember it took a really good friend to point out just how, have you noticed this pattern? (laughs) It's like, uh, (laughs) yes. Now that you say that, it's pretty obvious. But when you're in the pattern, you think it's just that your Tinder is broken or your match.com doesn't match you with the right people. It's pretty complex. I mean, relationships are the hardest thing we've ever pursued, which I think is always hilarious. When I work with groups, I always say, you know, isn't this so funny that we're here to like mate and then procreate <laughs> like, like on a very primal level, like we are here to bond with others. And yet it's the hardest thing for us to do. Like what kind of cosmic joke is this? Who's up there laughing? Like we must be somebody's reality TV show um, because it's just so ridiculous. We're trying to figure this out. <laughs> It's so funny when you say it that way. I think of the quote from Eric Fromm in The Art of Loving, where he says, there's nothing that people fail at more than love, yet we don't take the time to learn. Yeah. I don't know. It is it's it is like a cosmic joke. It's like, this is the very thing we're here to do. This is the very thing that has the greatest impact on our health. And yet it's not a class in school. And we are left to our own devices, which we don't have. Till we find a book, till we find, you know, we get on the internet, we find a TikTok, we find a whatever. And all of a sudden we're like, oh shit, you know? So I appreciate you saying that. It's funny. You know, the it's funny and it's not because we're like, imagine if they just had a class in school. Yeah. Well, imagine if we all took relationship more seriously and prioritized it as much as we do, you know, having a successful business or you know, getting a raise at our job or whatever it is, like we don't really look at relationship as this ultimate pillar of health in the way that I think we probably should. Because if you look at all of the disharmony and the pain in the world and the grabs for power and all of it, it's it's coming from these very wounded places within us. And where are we wounded? We're wounded in our first families. We're wounded in relationship. And so what would happen if everywhere we prioritized healthy relating, right? What would happen if everyone felt more secure and more safe and more worthy and more loved? We'd probably have a lot more balance. We'd probably have a lot less inequality. There would just be so much more harmony, I think, overall. So that's why I'm just so committed to the path of relationship, because to me, it's the most obvious way. Yeah, every time we change our own relationship patterns, we impact you know, at least 100 and maybe 150 people that we're going to come in contact with in our lives, right? So that's a pretty big impact. Yeah, that's massive. You realize that the change yourself, change the world, you know, the healing of self, when we develop boundaries, when we develop self-respect, when we develop all those things, all of a sudden other people experience the resonance of that, but also the pattern change of that. And then they're like, I want some of that after they experience, you know, they're first, they're like, don't do that. It's scary. But after they're like, that boundary is kind of badass. Like I noticed they got a swagger, you know? Yeah. And we free up energy too. So much of the energy that we spend in really unhealthy relationships or we spend, you know, mulling over these toxic dynamics that we're in or just in conflict constantly with our partner, all of that is wasted energy, right? And if we're really in our highest selves, if we're in our highest expression, then we're here to serve our communities, really. That's what we're here for, each of us. We have a pivotal role to play, which we've forgotten. We've become highly individualistic. We've really forgotten that we're here for others and for community and for family. And we just don't have the energy for that when we are just stuck in our own little personal hell that we've created within our romantic relationships, right? And so it's like breaking out of that alone gives us the energy to be of service, to, you know, create change in the world, to be more loving, to be a positive influence, to just give in some way. So it's pretty important that we 
step out of that dynamic eventually so that we can experience you know what true freedom looks like you can have true freedom in deep commitment many people don't recognize until they've gotten there but it is possible right liberation through limitation uh, something that i'm learning to embrace i remember the second thing that i wanted to reference that you spoke to was the normalization of what feels like boredom because I think for me, that was a big shift when there wasn't chaos in a relationship or a fear of not being chosen. It was so foreign to me that I wanted to kick up dust or try to figure something out to make it so I could get out of this feeling I'd never got to sit in, you know, which is trusting, which is normalizing what we might code as boredom, that it's actually peace, that it's actually dependability, that it's actually predictability. It's ironic to me that that often is in opposition with attraction or like what we would code as attraction because we don't find it sexy you know like you said about Grey's Anatomy it's like hot and cold and do they choose each other do they not we get lost in these stories being like oh I just want them to work out like we're constantly longing as opposed to like would we keep watching the story if it worked out and they just like moved in and then they're happy and there's not drama? Like, I don't know that we would. I know. It's 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 the funny way the mind works, right? And so it, it takes some reprogramming to settle into life. Like we just don't even have any clear role models of what healthy, stable relationships look like. So we have to create that. I think we're getting better. Like there are more people holding that space now, but I know for myself, it's really been joyous to experience bliss in nothingness together and to just be able to like have a day where, you know, we go and work on the garden or we just go for a walk and we make a meal and nothing really exciting happens, but we just had the best day ever, you know, and it's like that most of the time where there's not this big exciting thing happening. There's no, you know, high or low. It's just stable, calm, peaceful. And there's so much energy that can be created from that. And so, but it did, you know, it didn't, happen overnight for me. Like I, I noticed in my own system that I was often craving some disruption early on in our relationship. I think it took like five years for me to really unwind that pattern completely. So one of the things that I did was I noticed that my nervous system was craving that instability. And so instead of creating conflict or, you know, burning my life down, I would find ways to create adventure, you know? And so, you know, maybe that looked like redecorating my home or going, we would go on a camping trip or we would go and do something fun. And so I started to reprogram this highs and lows yearning for chaos that was very unconsciously buried in my cells and just to, began to create fun experiences. And eventually that pattern kind of dissolved. So I, that's one of the things that I recommend too in my book is if you notice that you have this sort of addiction to chaos, where can you put that energy in a way that would be really creative and make your life flourish more instead of burning the house down every time you have the urge? <laughs> because you might have that urge a lot, right? It's not the right thing to do. <laughs> what a thing to recode. I, that ability for us to notice the miracle in the mundane a fly is a miracle that a flower, but a weed, you know, like all what you're inviting us back to is something we need to do in every aspect of our lives, which is recognizing how much presence in presence, like we have these phones that are so structured to capture our attention. And we're going to constantly see cool videos and awe and all the magic that is designed to capture our brains. But we're missing out on like the magic that's in just such a simple moment. And it's kind of interesting to think that when we can do that in a relationship, everything changes. Yeah, Ben and I just started doing this uh, weekly cell phone detox, technology detox, really, where on a Sunday, we just turn off all of our devices. Well, Saturday night, you know, we'll turn off all of our devices and just tuck them away and then spend a full 24 hours without any technology at all. And it feels really good to do that and just to clear out the noise and just to be more present with each other and with ourselves. I feel like we need that now more than ever because we just have so many vehicles for communication. It's like overwhelming. 
It was so nice when people just had to send you a letter or like call you. <laughs> I know. Or your landline. I miss the landline. Oh man, right? I I say bring it all back. Throw back Thursday, all that shit. Um, but don't shut off your phone until after you listen to this podcast episode and <laughs> went on Amazon and bought Becoming the One. <laughs> well, it's good that we suggested um, this at the very end. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, Shay, thanks so much for taking the time. I appreciate you sharing your story. And I'm curious, where can people go find more of you and your book and all the details? Yeah, so the book you can find at risingwoman.com slash BTO book. By the time this podcast comes out, it'll be available in bookstores and on Amazon and pretty much everywhere online. And my personal website and Instagram is at Shalina Ayana or shalinaayana.com. And then my Rising Woman writing and content can all be found at Rising Woman on Instagram and risingwoman.com. And uh, if you follow me personally, you will get pretty much everything you get on Rising Woman channels, but you will also get a lot of photos of my dog and a lot of photos of food that I cook because I love to cook and a lot of gardening. So be warned for what you're signing up for. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll make sure that we link all those things in the show notes. So go check those out. Shay, I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks so much, love. It was a great, great time chatting with you again. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. If this episode resonated with you, one of the best ways to support the show is to go subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any more. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it, or share the episode with your community on Instagram or whatever social place you like to hang out. This helps get it into more people's ears, and I'm so grateful for your support, always. Thanks again for tuning in. Much love.